John Summers is the motoring historian. He was a company car thrashing technology sales rep that turned into a fairly inept sports bike rider. Hailing from California, he collects cars and bikes built with plenty of cheap and fast, and not much reliable. On his show, he gets together with various co-hosts to talk about new and old cars, driving, motorbikes, motor racing, and motoring travel. Good morning, good afternoon, good day to you wherever you may be. Welcome to The Motoring Historian. Uh, my name is John Summers and I'm here again with my school friend Mark Gammy. Um, say hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. Um, all right, so uh, without further ado, since we always talk a lot, let's have a look at our little agenda. And we were going to talk about Pebble Beach, weren't we? So what was your take on for me then? You know, you went there you know, for a the few days, you saw all the stuff, you hung around with the uh, the Richies. What was your what was your take? What was your highlight of the event? My highlight of the event was um, the morning of the tour. Um, I went down with with Ollie, my son. He's now, but and we've been once before. But this time he sort of knew what to do um, in terms of that you were like mingling with the cars and maybe taking some photos and he knew what he was doing this time. Um, when we went before, um, he uh, he had less of an idea of. So so this time, right, we, we I, I mingled with all the people I wanted to. He behaved extremely well for that. And, you know, listened and didn't wander off and get in other people's way and all of that kind of thing, which is the normal reason why small kids can't go to those kind of events. Anyway, you, you know what the tour is like, where all the cars drive out under that hoarding and the zillions of photographers, you know, professional photographers that are wanting to get paid for their, fo for their photographs be being there. Um, and I guess this time, I mean, I'm not sure how well you remember it, but normally they, they used to turn right out of there with this time they were turning left so because that was different and the police closed the road off in a different way there was more than the usual amount of jostling and sharp elbows and ollie and i were a little late on the scene and uh i realized as we like crossed over the road that there was nowhere for for us to to, to stand but ollie could stand at the front in front of the photographers below their height where they were standing as, as long as I went to the back. So I communicated that to him, communicated that to some very rude photographers and then left him at the front, knowing, trusting him to just stand at the front and, you know, watch, watch the cars off. So I was like at the back, um, but communicating with him. And I was by an NBC, like one of those NBC E. 350s that they have with the boom on the top of it that was doing filming and I didn't really pay attention to the other people that I was stood next to because I was like looking through like the side of the you know where the van the van's door was open I was like looking through the crack in the door to th like uh, to to see you know Ollie's little Ferrari hat to make sure he was where I left him and he was he was watching away um and uh, I realized I was standing next to Derek Hill, who's the master of ceremonies and whose dad is still the only American born Formula One world champion for Ferrari, no less. And, you know, a guy who supported Pebble for a really long time and, and you know, an all round nice guy, much too nice a guy to be a top racing driver, Phil Hill. That's the, that's the bottom line, much too much of a car lover to be the kind of person who tore up a racing car. You know, he, he, in later years, he was very much involved in the Pebble Beach show and restored cars. And the cars that he had tend to be really, you know, interesting ones. You know, he, he learned to drive on his mother's Pierce Arrow, you know, he and he never lost his love for those kind of pre, you know, those kind of interwar Gatsby era American classics that are beloved of the, of the Pebble Beach crowd. So, yeah, so um, so I was next to his son, who's about my age, and I said to him, you know, 
not quite what I just said to you, but I said, you know, that I respected his dad and, and, you know, um, yeah, I didn't gush in the way that I did when I met Lars Ulrich when I was about 25. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. Um, but, uh, um, I, I said something to him and, uh, we had a nice little backwards and forwards <laughs> conversation about, <laughs> you know, well, you know what it was about, right? Um, I have, um, I, I was wearing these terrible pair of, of tiger, um, you know, I wouldn't say trainers. They're more of this, they're like tennis shoes, aren't they? Kind of, but those Oninsuka tigers, they're about my third pair. And uh, the pair that I have at the moment, well, um, my wife's like, you can't wear those. And I was like, well, there's nothing else. And she went, well, they're terrible. You have to like, you, you should buy new shoes. And like, anyway, so I was kind of embarrassed of my shoes because, you know, they always say you can judge how wealthy a bloke is by his shoes. And by that measure, I'm the, I look like the pauper I am, right? Um, so that doesn't always jive properly at Pebble. But I'm like, whatever, I'm just doing me this time. I'm going with Ollie. I'm not trying to be somebody I'm, I'm not. So old Derek Hill goes, I like your shoes. I go, oh, really? My wife hates them. And he goes, oh, really? And then he puts his foot next to mine. And I realise that he's got the same shoe as me. And I, he's a much newer and nicer, but he's got the same shoe as, as me. So we, so we, we compare shoes a, a, a little bit. And then Ollie comes over because the first batch of cars has, has gone and he's wearing like Ferrari cap and shirt. So Derek Hill engages him and Ollie is, you know, as behaves as one would hope a eight-year-old boy would when meeting, uh, you know, old, blo uh, so, you know, old bloke who's going to chit-chat about Ferrari. And uh, old Hill turns to me and says, uh, interesting uh, conversation we had. I like the way you tell a story. Let me take your name and email address. I may get in touch with you. So I gave him the name and, and email address. And uh, and he said, uh, your boy's better behaved than mine. And then went on his way to do his piece for uh, NBC. Yeah, so I guess that's the first thing that, that came to mind for me for a fun moment. Let me let me share a more automotively focused moment with you as, as well. Do you remember Laurelie's grade? that road that goes up over the hill from near Laguna Seca and then down the other side. And you may know that I know that road quite well since I stay there now, or in the last couple of years I've stayed near there. And, and I've also um, done, you know, journalist test drive stuff along that, that road. So I'm, not, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident along there. So I use the E55 uh, for, for the job this year. And, uh, at the foot, uh, when I turned off 68 to go right the way over the top, at the foot of the grade, there was a car, probably a pair of taillights, probably 300 yards in front of me. This is about, you know, 11.30 at night, late at night, empty road. Um, clear, good, yeah. good weather. Um, and he was about, and in the lower section, you can go really fast, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, really fast. And, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, so that's what I did. Um, and it it's only with hindsight that you realise that it was surprising that I didn't catch the pair of taillights at that point. But as the road became twistier, I caught up the pair of taillights. And it was a Remac Nevera, I kid you not. Now, this was uh, when it got gets really twisty towards the top before the descent. Well, on the descent, dude, he couldn't leave me. I knew the road. I was all the way. Well, once it got straight down towards Bernardus, he got a bit of a gap on. But, and then... On the entry to Bernardus, he stopped to see me by, right? Because I was probably 100 yards back by that point. And he was turning in, turning left into Bernardus. And I kid you not, I, I mean, the satisfaction that it gave me when a 20-year-old E55 with rust on the sunroof 
he couldn't put a gap between that and his 2000 horsepower remac that amused me somewhat um i i guess my thought on it is that i must have known the road somewhat better than than him yeah um a little agenda of 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 pebble um and we were just talking about the the remac there i was really struck by the number of of modern supercars there were um and talking with um other people within the actual pebble community um i i think um there's almost a subculture of um pebble beach car week people emerging and and it's you know it's it's okay so i was parked up in my little spot on carmel valley road you know the spot Mm -hmm. i was parked up there doing you know sitting by the side of the road watching the cars come by and uh, the old um you know juan's gardening service dropped a uh, cone off the back of his pickup truck and it's there lying in the road and I can see it in the rear view and all these cars coming up the hill, they can't see it. And everybody knows it's that test route, right? And I'm looking at it and it's about two yards into one carriageway. So it's not right in the road, but it's blocking it. Mm. It's making that carriageway very narrow, right on a bend when so I'm thinking, wow, there could be a head on here. If somebody makes a bad decision about placing the car coming up the hill and swerves around this thing a lot, then so they could head on somebody because they could go over the yellow line. Or if somebody slows down and there's somebody else who's test driving a Lucid or a McLaren up the hill here, they're, you know, they could potentially be doing, you know, autobahn kind of speeds so that's so anyway so i hopped out of the e55 trotted over moved the the cone and as i moved the cone i kid you not two dozen mclarens came by and i'm like you know they weren't making cars 10 years ago right that's why there's such a and similarly lamborghinis so many Gallardos, so many Hurricanes, particularly, so many even Aventadors, you know, the the stuff, so much stuff that has been made in just the last 10 years, 10 or 15 years, you know, since, um, yeah, I don't know, I want to say since the Audi takeover in the case of, of Lamborghini, but yeah, there, there seems to be, um, and those people aren't coming to the Pebble Beach car show it, it, itself. So I feel like there's a whole subculture of Pebble Beach developing that must that must exist for shows and events um, for people between the age of like you know eighteen and forty. And I feel like I'm in the doing the events for the people between, you know, forty and one hundred and forty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah, you're definitely not with the uh, the Fast and Furious crew in their pimp mobiles outside. It must be said. Um, but I mean, look, it, it's I think anything like that, if I understand you correctly, sort of gathers sort of subcultures and stuff as it becomes wider. I mean, that thing's obviously been known around for ages, but. Um, as it gets more exposure and it's live streamed on YouTube and all these sort of stuff, it, it sort of becomes a bit of a broader event for people to engage in, I suppose. So it's more people turn up, more people sort of doing their own thing around it. But um, it's Carol Shelby Ferrari 410, the red one that's numbered 98 that RM had. Um, dude, I was like, that's great. Like, that's the one. That's yeah. the one. You know, I wonder how much it it's is. Kind of low, you know? And then as you approach, you're like, dude, that is a big capacity Ferrari sports car from the late 50s. So that is a that is a big money car all day long. The estimate was 25 to 27. So I think it I think it, it it's sold for 22. 
Yeah, I don't have trouble believing that. It's kind of a bargain. Next to that $142 million Ulan Hout coup, it was a bargain. (laughs) I mean, yeah. Yeah. Let's have a little look at Gooding. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. What caught your eye there? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just scrolling through Gooding results. So I, I've got as far as lot eighteen. That if, if you know, purely from my heart, regardless of of values, that was the car that I was absolutely and and completely in in love with. Um, the picture there doesn't do its faded glory any kind of of justice it was um the paint was so faded off that i loved the red and that black interior was was more tired than the interior of uh, of my e55 but it was those are the 400 gt2 plus two Lamborghini. yeah yeah absolutely yeah the lamborghini 400 gt yeah 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 i'm just looking at, i mean I'm just looking at the picture of it now um, from the uh, from the old Gooding website, and uh, my word, what an awesome car! Love that. Yeah, there's some nice stuff there. A lot of Porsches. A lot of Porsches. A um, lot of roofs. You know, a sense that they're trying mm-hmm. to, um, and and yeah, a sense with the roofs particularly that they they're trying to create. Um, a sort of rarefied market for for Porsches. You know what I mean? It's like when Ducati do a version of the bike that has the really expensive wheels and suspension on it, and they're only going to do a hundred of them. They're, you know what I mean? They're, they're deliberately trying to create something that's a collector vehicle. And I feel that by packaging, um, I'm looking at lots four and five. I feel that by packaging lot four alongside lot five, I feel like lot five, the 1990 car is collectible. I feel like lot four, I don't know. I mean, it hammered for more than lot five, I guess, because it's rarer. But that, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, the collectible Porsche market, I can't pretend to, uh, to, to understand. Yeah. I'm looking here. I'm, I'm amazed. No, I mean, I would, I'd have had the cheaper Porsche. I'd have had the uh, 2004 GT3 996 and saved lots of money. Well, it's funny looking round. That was the car that I uh, that, that I liked. Um, you forget how long the chin overhang is, don't you? Like, yeah, and and the uh, people hate on the the nine nine sixes now, but that's a great looking car. That lot ten, where it really, yeah. it really is. Um, and you're right that next to the other, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a real yeah. bargain. Um, yeah, and the, the roof thing is, it's it's investor money gone gone silly. I mean, well, and also like the because you've got to remember that, that you know on Gran Turismo they didn't have the Porsche license, but they had the RUF license, so therefore you could have a rough GT, you know, um, CTR two and things like that, but you couldn't have a nine eleven for quite a long time. So that was the only way you get these in the game. Uh, did not know that. Yeah, yeah, man. Gran Turismo law there for you. The other thing that um, that Ollie and I spent a long time hanging around was if you scroll down to lots 56, uh, 58 and 59, um, some guy was mm-hmm. having his basically having a race car collection liquidized and and there were some awesome uh cars he had that this lot 58 this bud march 85 um that evolved into the porsche 956 designed by adrian newey um and this aar all american racers gurney indy car um that was you, you you look at the picture there the little thumbnail image on gooding's website here and it, it looks like a cool old car. You stand next to it, and it's like a UFO. It's like a 200 mile an hour land born UFO. Really uh, uh, an, an awesome lad. A lot of the structure when you look at it from the side is engine. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. That's cheap, man. 112, 112 grand for that. That's yeah, awesome. because it's hard to enjoy. True, true. Yeah. I mean, it is essentially a complete toy. Um, and probably undrivable on most of the circuits in the world because they have noise limits, which it would break. Well, I was thinking that if it's truly an Indy car, it's probably set up to only turn left. So it means that, so, so for me, right, I would do collectible NASCARs, but I would only want to do it. Or I would only want to collect road course cars um, because I've never driven on ovals. So it would be impossible for me to enjoy a car that had been set up for a super speedway you know you just you just to me i if that car had been set up for yeah. indy you're like dehistoricizing it to to set take it away from indy let's if it had been set up for road course and it looked like that i looked closely at it and it seemed you know as if it had equal you know suspension arms and things like that um at that point um but again to enjoy it right you need a hauler you need to go to a particular event you know you need probably a you know a mechanic if if not you know you need to be really good yourself and have a lot of time to spend on it you know it's a much car harder car to enjoy than you know that lot 60 that's next to it that gull wing you can take that to a cars and coffee you know you can take your wife out to dinner in in that if you know, yeah. if it's in a nice place and you've got a nice place. To I'd take your point. With. But like, you know, there's a bit of a gap between the two price wise. <laughs> well, I I, 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 yes, but that's why a, a, I mean, and that's a really nice example of a gull wing, isn't it? I'm not sure if it's an aluminium body one there. It's got yeah. the rudge wheels and the silver makes it is, is you know, but no, it, I think that's why racing cars generally, historic racing cars, are often far cheaper than you think because finding an environment to enjoy them is is really hard true that yeah now there's some nice stuff here and there's stuff where you think that's you know i mean it's got plenty to go i mean i'm no expert on the used car market but just by the sort of sort of gut feels i mean that 990 m3 looks like a about where you expect it to go for, but yeah, I think there's some appreciation in there over the next 10 what years. What is that M3? Uh, 108. We, uh, we, like looked, that we looked at that, Ollie and I looked at that car. He liked the car, um, and, and the car was cosmetically not perfect. It, it felt to me Maybe like that, that was a car that was part of a collection, which David Gooding had had to sell all of them rather than that one, because that car didn't meet the sort of presentation standards that he uh, might normally have there, there. Some of the trim was faded on it. Um, I'm saying that like I'm a Pebble Beach judge. Obviously that made the car far more appealing to, to me because um, it felt drivable. Mm. It felt like it had been driven and it felt drivable. I mean, dude, I mean, the, lately I'd get to, I'm all right, I'll bugger with this sort of stuff. If it can't be driven regularly, I'm not interested in it. Like, I'm interested in it from a point of view of like, you know, the sort of stuff you see in museums and things. And like, it's nice to know that they're still around. And, you know, if I have ever rich enough to buy that sort of stuff and then lucky enough to be able to rinse it at Goodwood, I will definitely do so. Um, because that's what they're for. Um, so, it, you know, it's, but that depends on the type of car, doesn't it? But, um, so I always end up looking at the stuff like that and then going like, cool, but if I had the money, you know, it'd be nice to go to lunch in the 3500 GT Maserati. That'd be pretty cool. So it'd be nice to have that sort of light thing to cruise around in. Um, but uh, I mean, it's this, yeah, it's like a kid in a sweet shop. There's so much stuff that you could have. It's amazing. My uh, philosophy is to, to split um, the stuff that you have to drive um, from the the stuff that's that's purely collectible, because there is something, um, you know, glorious about something like a dragster, which can only run on nitromethane, and you know, it needs a full rebuild after you run it. Um, these are magnificent, magnificent machines. And 
there should be room in the corner of the barn to keep these things. There's yeah, 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 for real. I mean, that's fair enough. Those top fuel things are just crazy. So my version of that is sports bikes and Suzuki GSXRs particularly, and I. That is why I've thought a lot about this idea of of things being hard to enjoy, because um, Jixxers are hard to enjoy on on the road. You know, most of them can do 100 miles an hour in first gear, so that makes them a hard thing to to enjoy. And and you know, I lack the skill to enjoy them properly on on the track, and it leaves you in this place of feeling where there really is no place for them yet they remain absolutely glorious in their intersection of huge performance and super, super accessible price point. It's like the democratization of performance. And maybe that's why we were talking about the guys with the McLarens and the Lamborghinis. I think that's maybe why I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm snide about them because I'm everyone, I, I want everybody to enjoy the, the car hobby and and automobiles and so on in their own way. But you do feel a, a little bit as if, um, you know, I would feel a little bit of a uh, poser in, in a Lamborghini when you can achieve. Let's just create a pause here whilst Dana gets her lunch in. You're not really a classic car person. You're like a driving person. I've always thought this about you. You're like a driving person who has the right, like a running person who has the right shoes for, for the job. The interest in cars is the same as the runner's interest in running shoes in making sure he's got the right the right tool for the job. Um, and classic cars are never going to be the best tool for the job. Um, but here's the thing. You know, when I had a small lump of money a while ago, I, I looked at buying a, a classic car. And the whole thing with it is, is that I'm not, you know, I could have bought a nice-ish muscle car. Um, but I I just couldn't see myself like buying a deck chair and going to car shows and parking up and sitting in the deck chair and, you know chit-chatting with people about you know how it was a five speed now but it used to be a three speed and you know no it wasn't a big block and you know and I'm just I don't know that's not where the the hobby is is for me so you know I like the fact that different people do the hobby in different kinds of ways if you want to have a you know have a mustang in your semi-detached house in you know the home counties of england you know if you want to have a 60s you know automatic 289 Hmm. mustang you know be my guest you know it's not my thing but but be my guest i i do draw the line i i see people with you know that blobby era that white car that we're looking at my racing car the the 95 94 95 that kind of of era um that blobby body style those cars with six cylinder engines for me not collectible with eight cylinder engines not to my taste but collectible i like my car because it's slammed and it's got the cobra wheels on it but it sort of needs those things without those things oh they're a little bit like capri 1.6s and capri 1.3s they're just I just, oh, I, I mean, I, I love, I love, I love those cars in their ultimate form. You know, and this is an interesting question. Um, I, I asked um, a room full of design professionals at Stanford University, no less. I say a room full, I mean a, a table of people sitting around the table. Um, is the purest form of the Chevrolet Camaro, the six-cylinder rental car that you pick up at the airport? the convertible that everybody drives that they make the most of with the automatic transmission and the steel wheels and the tour tires 
Is that the purest iteration of Camaro? Or is the purest iteration of Camaro the ZL1 with the supercharged 650 horsepower V8 and the stick shift and the look like it just fell out of the Transformers movie because it just did, um, which is the pure iteration of, of Camaro. And they said, oh, always the most extreme one because that's what the designer intended. That's what the designer had in mind when he thought of Camaro, he or she thought of Camaro, they thought of that extreme interpretation. They thought Z01, they thought Z28, um, they thought, you know, black alloy wheels, not silver painted pressed steel ones. I mean, yeah, so that's interesting. So that, so, so do they, I mean, because I never really considered which way round they, but they, they do these. Because when you see concept car designs and you see design art studio people doing interpretations or gesture, you know, and the thought experiments for um, uh, manufacturers, even though they aren't working for them necessarily, it's sort of like as much a CV effort, if you like, but still, um, they always do the cool version. It's very rare they'll do a homogenous, dull box. <laughs> on the basis of that, that might be what it would be dumbed down to. So you have to assume, therefore, that the designers don't change much when they become employed by the manufacturers so that they do do it that way around. I just never considered it that, because that, what a depressing process, taking something that you've just made epically cool and then just boring the crap out of it in order to make it a more sort of like steel wheel, sellable, 50,000 unit shit box in comparison to this gorgeous supermodel of a build that you've got in clay in the workshop you know they won't build for four years because they've got to run out of enough enough metal to make enough money to be justify your concept car so i i met the bloke that was chief designer on the volvo xc90 which not to my taste but not you know a great car and loved by other great cars i mean famously clarkson had three of them didn't he when he was uh was a family man so I can acknowledge these are uh, are a well designed vehicle, even if they're not not my thing. And I said to him, I asked him, when you see them on the road, is it like seeing one of your children? You know, do you feel like proud of it when you see it? And he said, honestly, no, because there's so many elements of it which have changed. You know, I'm proud of what my team achieved, but. I, you know, equally, I see elements of it, of the design, and I'm not going to tell you what they are, which I really don't like. I see elements of the design I feel I told you so about to my team, and that I can't say, I'm not going to say to you, and I, I wouldn't say to them either, but I know when I look at that car, there are those things. Um, now, I met the old, the, I met, I can't remember the bloke's name, Japanese guy that designed the Nissan Leaf. And he was saying that until the sort of turn of the century, probably, one person designed a car. But now it's really a, a committee designs a car. And really, they might say, oh, you know, Dave Jones designed it. But really, that's because Dave Jones is a handsome young guy and the firm feel that he's the right person to represent them in talking about the design ethos of the company. He, you know, he didn't really design it. It's like the famous Bangle Butt, that Chris Bangle was the design lead, but it was actually Adrian von Hoyendoik, the guy who then went to Lamborghini and I don't know where he is now, but it was him that actually did that design feature. It wasn't actually Chris Bangle um, at all. Um, um, the fellow that designed the Leaf, he said that it changed in that. The, so I, I, so you know, do, does the Leaf, you know, this it changed from being a single person who had their stamp on a vehicle. So I so for him, the car that he feels is very much him is the 1980s Nissan Maxima. Not 
the Nissan Maxima that you will remember that crazy Texan <laughs> perfume salesman World in Parfum. the 1990s, which was a powerful... World Parfum. I'm sorry? It was the company, as I recollect. Yeah, World Parfum. Yeah. Well, fuck me. That's all right. Headline on oh, Ars Technica on the cars page: Audi Audi will build F1 engines entering the sport in 2026. Didn't Audi or didn't Volkswagen always say they always they never wanted to do Formula One because they felt that they were developing a technology that would have no reflection on their road cars. So my understanding was they never wanted to do Formula One. Because they were building lots of that would mean building V6s or V8s or V10s, and that was not something that they wanted to do. Whereas now, Formula One's doing four cylinder engines, it seems logical that Audi or VAG or whatever they're calling themselves now, PX organization would be interested in in doing, yeah, it looks like they're gonna have two in there, Porsche and, and Audi. Um. Yeah, the designer of the Leaf, he said he designed the first generation Maxima, not that blobby one that that World Parfum guy that we worked with in Richmond or Alabama or wherever, Richmond, Virginia or wherever it was all those decades ago, not that 90s blobby Maxima, um, a squared off 80s version of uh, of that car but with the same virtues as that car of the world parfum guy that you'll remember like you know american style appointments inside and a remarkable lick of speed for a fairly staid looking you know automatic sedan um that so in the 80s you felt like it was your car when you were a designer into the 90s you lost that feeling and, you know, by the 20th century, um, maybe it had gone completely. And that ties into what we were talking about, you know, when, uh, with Lucid a couple of weeks ago, that that was a small design team that had a free hand to decide what they wanted to design, what they wanted to design. And they had this ethos of designing from the inside out. Um, and I know I also wanted to revisit uh, a comment that we made in a in a previous pod about the shape being bland, the lucid shape being bland. Um, it's wind cheating. So it has to be that way. What isn't bland is if you see the car at night, the headlight pattern is completely different from any other car. And that's something which has changed. And I think it's quite interesting just in the last couple of years is that car makers are looking to give themselves a brand identity in the shape of, of the headlights for, for Rivian. Rivian are doing it as well. They have a little oval, but car makers are increasingly giving themselves a brand identity through the headlight shape. And I kind of, I, through the headlight shape, not in the day, at night, the way it projects at night. And I, I for one, think that's interesting and mm. futuristic. I suppose I was cool. thinking of the 991's wraparound taillight and those Maserati boomerang taillights on the 3200 that I so love that they then got rid of. Um, but it's interesting when the manufacturers play with it a bit and do a bit something a bit different. Sometimes it's not very well received, which is a bit of a shame because on reflection, like those Maserati lights, they were they were cool. Um, yeah. The Maserati lights really were a, a, a thing, those boomerang tail lights on those early Maserati um, coupes. 3200s i think they lost it for the 4200s is a real shame but they had them from the 3200s definitely um weird cars those because you get them out in the grand and the grand um sports they've got an smg only but it's a paddle shift actual manual if i recall that was the era of i'm not sure if that car had it but that was the era of sequential semi-automatic transmissions wasn't it you had two pedals and it, you went up and down the gearbox like a motorcycle where you had to be in every gear i remember the alpha gta had that kind of gearbox 
the Alpha 156, the hot rod version of that. You could get it with a mm. pick, or you could get it with basically a sequential. It was, it was a sequential. It acted like an automatic transmission in that it didn't have a, a clutch pedal, but you moved paddles to make it shift. Or with some cars, and I think this Alpha, you had like a, like a touring car. You knocked the lever forward or you knocked it back to, to shift. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like, the cars will do that as well. On the manuals, they have that sort of flip across from sort of the sort of up from, you know, R down to D and stuff um, on the left hand side, you can click it over and then bang it up and down, can't you? Yeah, this was um, this is different than on BMW on than yeah. on most cars because most cars that BMW system, the car still has a torque converter. I'm not sure if those Alfa Romeos had a conventional torque converter or if they just had a clutch like a motorcycle clutch, you know, in a gearbox that was was uh, I think it may have been a different. A different thing but we don't know so we're just whittling aren't we um <laughs> we've talked for ages here uh, you're just back from the pyrenees or wherever you were in france with this uh, uh spiffy new car like how was the vacation very nice thanks um and we've spoken briefly about it some of the highlights of the holiday you know busy in the neem amphitheater and so forth roman Colosseum outside of italy fabulous um still being used for entertainment that was superb but getting back to the car um yeah i mean like you know it's 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 nice i mean i've done like i think 2600 miles on it now to be fair most of that's payage comfort mode just tickling along and it does that sort of you know middle weighty stuff the car of just loping along and eating the miles pretty effectively it's quite comfortable uh, i saw a review saying that the seats bite your ass after a while but i didn't find that so that was nice um and you know it looks decent um i've graunched the front <laughs> wheel even further because when you've got a wife who's got a hip problem you want to get as close to the little sort of uh petit bras um, leaning out the left-hand window with your little arms to get to the uh, the payage, pay on the thing and uh, pull the ticket out stuff. So you want to get as close as possible. So inevitably, with the different um, new car, just for, um, judging the uh, the wheel the uh, wheel arches, and of course the wheel arches being extended out from the body shape by a couple of inches and three to the front and three inches or whatever it is at the back, I made mistakes. So I need to have the wheels respayed. But yeah, you know, anyway, getting back to the meat of it. Uh, yeah, I like it. It's it's a nice car. Um, it's weird in comfort mode because when you give it some beans, it's got such it's got a noticeable drop off in power about below three and a half thousand revs. So if you don't take it up to about four and a half five, it drops down to that three and a half, um, and then it's a little bit before it sort of picks back up again when the turbo sc scrolls up. Um, so it's quick anyway, but that can make it almost feel a bit lurchy. So you sort of need to bang into sport um, and then give it the beans and remember that it'll happily rev up to about 7k. Uh, and then if you're not up about five or six, you know, why? Um, and then it's pretty damn good. So it's, uh, it feels decent. I mean, it's, the exhaust notes egregious when you start up from cold. Um, it really is. Um, we stayed, we were fortunate enough to stay in some nice places and you're conscious that you're in a, you know, a quiet chateau and you're leaving at seven o'clock to drive up to Lascaux or six o'clock in the morning to drive up to Lascaux caves a few hundred miles away. <laughs> And that there's no way you can turn your car on and not wake everyone else in the shadow, which feels a bit bad. Um, but hey ho. Um, but yeah, no. Overall, it, it feels tight. I mean, the nicest driving I did, I suppose, was up in the Pyrenees. I'm not hugely surprising. There's the, the one of the roads that drives across from Po down towards um, the Spanish border, um, goes up towards um, Oh, cool. One of the a couple of the coals and the peak de midi and so forth. And yeah, it's really, it's, there's some cracking roads. I got really lucky with a bit where I just came out and it was all sunny. And uh, I turned left when there was a big queue of people going right and drove towards Spain for about, I don't know, 20, 30 miles and didn't really see anyone. Maybe not that far in distance, but had a good 15, 20 minutes of just really enjoying some lovely, nice sweeping sort of, if it was in England, A roads, you know, two lanes, one lane each way, but. Some reasonable twists and turns and elevation changes and stuff. So beautiful scenery, like little river down at the side of the road and so forth. Um, lovely sight lines and stuff. So that was a real sort of gem of a moment. And um, it likes that sort of thing a lot. Um, and you can make very rapid progress, as you would expect in that sort of car, without really straining it particularly. You can stay below the turbo really spooling up 
and still lope along in effortless, decent pace. Um, but there is, uh, you know, a noticeable jump up when you ramp above that. I mean, that said, the torque's still available from reasonably mid range, so it doesn't have, feel like it's got a sort of rabid top end. Um, and I'm me interested in there's a Litchfield um, conversion where you can get a larger intercooler and push it up to the same sort of horsepower as on the competition. So it'll go up from like 370 to the 410 ish, something like that. Uh, and they do um, a tune with the exhaust um, to map it out properly. I'd be quite interested in that um, in a little bit of time, I think, um, because there's clearly higher, more you can get from the top end of that car, as proved by the, um, the, the competition and the other ones that came afterwards. But yeah, it looks nice. It's carried all the luggage pretty well. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I still don't feel I know it properly. I'm going to see if I, I can squeeze it into a track day at Thruxton before the end of the year if we get some nice, if the weather holds out, because um, it's just not very far away, and then have a bit more of a uh, feel of it at you know decent speeds. Because again, I mean, on the road, you can't really give it, well, you shouldn't be giving it anywhere near what it can deliver. Um, so you don't really get a proper feel for what it's like, um, even, you know, getting to the limits of traction on second gear corners and so forth, you're still at points where, you know, it's too fast. You, know, you shouldn't be doing that sort of speed on the road kind of thing. And if so, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think it'll be, it'll be fun to take it on track and see what, see what it, it delivers there as well. So yeah, no, early, early indications are good. I mean, I will say as a slight downside to the upside that the Experience of buying used approved didn't really improve the car. There's about three things wrong with it. Um, the uh, I won't bore you. Well, I can bore you with the reversing in the proximity warning doesn't turn off when you pull it out of reverse and put it into first gear. You have to turn the car off and on to stop the fucking thing beeping, which is quite annoying. Um, the map update that I bought for about 80 quid or whatever it was to have up to date maps before I went to Europe won't install, so that was quite annoying. <laughs> Um, and it's got worse aircon. They when I when it arrived, uh, I was thinking, oh look, it's the aircon's so cold that you can almost see like cold mist coming out of the 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 um uh, the vents. And I thought, hmm, that feels suspicious. I like that they've overgassed it or something because the aircon's actually not very good. Uh, and yeah, I'm. It, it's got basically slowly worse over the period of the holiday. Um, and, you know, if you set it at sort of 21 or 22, it just doesn't get there on a hot day. It just stays like going really high and carrying on forever and never makes it to that temperature, which feels pretty shit when my wife's Fiesta ST will do that comfortably. So um, I'm suspicious that uh, there might be a reason why that dealership didn't want to do that work. Um, I mean, look, maybe it's just got a leak, but I feel that it might be one of those ones where they need to take the front of the engine off or something to get to the AC compressor. And it's that sort of ball ache of a job. So it's easier for someone else to do it under warranty from the BMW dealership. So maybe I'm just a suspicious bastard. Finding um, um, an air conditioning leak like that, which it sounds like what you've got, finding that, what a uh, pain in the bottom that's going to be. Well, I, I mean, I've got 12 months BMW warranty because it's used to prove, which is what I bought from the dealer. And I've got the extended upgraded warranty on it as well. So unlucky boys give me a spare car while you fix it well that would seem to be um in the case of the air conditioning something that uh that i would look for look for them to do does it feel meaningfully faster than you know your nissan had what has what or had <laughs> what, um what had 307 307 so it doesn't yeah, feel meaningfully one. faster than that yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it does. Um, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, I think the Nissan's 5.5 to 60, and that's with the SMG box, I think it's 4.5. I think with the manual, it's like 4.7 um, to 60. So, you know, it's pretty pokey uh, and it's very fast. Um, it's, it was interesting that, you know, I, I Angie's a pretty good wingman for a for a, a wag, <laughs> awful way to say. <laughs> but she's pretty savvy with the uh, old overtaking and uh, seeing ahead and you know judging gaps for me to be able to, to overtake on French roads because obviously you're you're pass you're driving from the gutter uh, in your right hand drive car. 
Um, she's pretty good at that, but it took her a while to sort of get up to speed from the shift from 276 to 370 in terms of the available sort of point and squirt and nab gaps um, was no, there was, there was much more potential for overtaking with uh, less requirement for, um, yeah, perceived distance to oncoming uh, collision. Yeah. So yeah, no, it, it, so that, that was good fun. Um, I had, it was funny actually, I, I, I had it, drove it back from um, Colchester, um, just tootling around on a sort of Friday or Monday afternoon, whatever it was. Um, and then I took her out in the, that evening just to go down to the pub. And two people on the way down there, some guy cut trimming his hedge. I was a bit fruity through the, through the, uh, the, uh, he lives in a little village down. Um, there's some lanes between us and him. And there's about six houses before another lane by the garden center and the pub. And he was tripping his hedge. And I'd obviously been giving it a bit of a footfall <laughs> for the missus um, uh, with it in sport mode. So it was giving it the full trombone. Um, and uh, as it, I came around the corner, he'd stopped trimming the hedge. I was like looking down the lane to see who was coming. <laughs> and uh, as I drove past him, he gave me the little sort of like divers, like nice, <laughs> you know, as I came past. Uh, and then some old gimmer like like nodded appreciatively as we drove past as well. And Angie was like, are you telling me that this new car you've got, two people have just given you the thumbs up on the way to the pub? Um, and it does feel a bit more, I mean, like, that, that lad I know who's got, who had the uh, Lamborghini until recently, it's a, a sort of sniff of his world in the sense that, you know, wherever you go in that sort of car, everyone's looking at you. It's like it, it, you're walking around with an absolute supermodel in your arm. I mean, it's that sort mm-hmm. of level of consciousness. I'm not there at all, but it did feel like a guy in a French um, garage said to Angie, like, ton car, votre car, votre voiture est parfait, you know, like, you know, kind of thing, as she was like trying to use the loo in there. Um <laughs> So you do get more notice in it. Um, and I wasn't necessarily quite after that um, at all, which is part of the reason I went for an M2, because it's a sort of chunked up two series. You know, it's just a two series, and there's not a lot to see. I mean, the fact it's got four exhausts and punched out M badges all over the show, I can sort of ignore that. Um, and most punters do, but it's still, you know, I suppose I can't play game to be too shy of retiring, given I painted the wheels gold. But... Um, Although, no, I, again, I, the I, wheels I, gold, that's not the gold that I asked for. I asked for frozen gold. And what they've done is lazily painted over the, the, the gloss black in a couple of coats of frozen gold and gone, oh, you've got that sort of weird bronze color. Well, it looks quite cool. You can have that. Which, in theory, is fine. But when you inevitably scuff them, you can't buy a rattle can of frozen gold to fix the, the, the bit because it's not the right color. So you're never going to be able to repaint them to that color. Um, so I'm going to have to have, when one's got a bit of a nick, I'm going to need to get them all repainted to the color I asked for in the first place. Um, otherwise, they're going to look bad ended. So there is a difference. Yeah, I would. Um, with that issue with them painting the, you know, painting frozen gold wheels over the black and not stripping the black back. And, and now, you know, you being in this position where because you damaged one, you can't just repaint that one. You have to repaint all four. Um, I feel your best recourse is to have a conversation with the dealer and explain to them that in a reasonable way and then try and get them to cover some of the cost of doing the job properly. Because you don't need to rub their face in the fact that it's their fault that you're in this position and you only recently purchased the car you know it's not like you bought it six months ago you only just bought it now well, it's, it, going, it's going to go back in for the other things to be fixed on it anyway um look, we'll see i mean i suspect they'll be reasonable about it but um I'm, i mean all the stuff that's wrong with it i think they'll fix i don't think they'll meet me halfway on the price for that i mean like i was the one that damaged the wheel to be fair let's not mess about um so that'll probably be their excuse and you know, probably justifiably it's just slightly annoying that i haven't got an easy recourse to a fix because of the route they took which was a bit of a lazy shortcut so you know, um there you are but still look yeah big picture do i like the car yep very much so um and it was nice being in macron's 
uh, price governed uh, petrol universe uh, of France where it's cheaper there because he's put a cap on the, the fuel prices. So um, uh, 98 Ron was um, about 10% cheaper than it would be over here, even if you were buying it from the yeah, payage services. Nice. Didn't know that about the French fuel cap holding uh, holding prices down there. Mm. So uh, the next little item on the agenda: automatic stop start systems. Mm. That's another thing that doesn't work on the BMW. Well, good. <laughs> I, I spent some time in in a pub with a man from Birmingham who worked for the post office, who was a postman. And he said that these vans that they have that have the automatic stop start, it just destroys the, the vehicles because it, because the thing's stopping and starting all the time. So by the time it's done about 150,000 miles, the things turned on and switched off so many times that all of those components, everything associated with the stopping and starting, is worn out. Well, they're going to ban all that stuff soon anyway, aren't they? Because it's all going to be pe- it's going to be electric cars sooner or later. Um, so that gets rid of that problem. Um, but uh, they do need to fix the infrastructure problem in terms of charging stations before they're able actually to achieve that. Uh... Yeah, and how long do cars last in Britain? I mean, in, in California, when I was learning to be a smog tech, my understanding was, was that any law passed in Sacramento you know, any w- would take 18 years to penetrate 80% of California's fleet. So, in other words, you can say no more gas-powered cars being made today, right today, and it would still be 2034 before 80% on the car of the cars on the road were electric. If you so so, what we're saying is there's still going to be many gas-powered cars around in 2045. By that measure, if Gavin Newsom, you know, bans cars as he said he was going to, or as the California Legislature is meant to do in in twenty in 2035. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the actual actual stop-start systems themselves, I I feel that. I suppose they're part of a. They're related to these problems with diesel particulate filters that people are having with big diesel trucks, because these big diesel trucks have these DPF systems on them, and the canisters get blocked up. And you have to replace them, and if you don't, eventually they clog up and stop the truck altogether. So, well, basically, all the trucks that have higher miles on them have just had this DPF delete. Because the trucks themselves will do like half a million miles. And if it's your job working as like a car hauler, you're going to do like 200,000 miles in a year. Well, that would mean every three months you were having a DPF thing done. So they just like, you know, delete them. Then the engines make way more power. There's actually court cases where the people who sell these delete kits are being taken to court by the uh, EPA just uh, at, at the moment. I'm sure if we google around we would uh, we would find those kind of stories but but yeah um all emission systems make the mechanics of just making um cars work much much harder and it all looks to people who just have to make a living with these kind of tools like society is conspiring against them um and, and you know i get the environmental angle but you know, it's uh, it's tiring, and the automatic stop start thing I fear is another one of those kind of uh, one of those kind of things. Hmm. I, I, mean, I, I can see the well meaning attitude, but like if it's uh, smashing the car a lot quicker, then it, it's yeah, it's, you struggle to then make the uh, justify the the other savings, don't you? I'm reminded of that Grey Sierra that you had that also had an automatic stop. But it was like it was like Greeps half bulimia, you know, where you uh, where you eat all the food and then don't throw up. Um, is this is, is is the same thing? Your Sierra used to have automatic stop and not start, 
wouldn't it? it for, for a long yeah. while in the winter there. Really good at that. Yeah, it would, it would, you needed to be in the throttle for it to idle. So you needed bloody three feet every time you were approaching a roundabout or sitting in traffic, especially if you were on a little incline. Yeah. The Mitsubishi Mirage, right? This is the winner of the John Summers Award for the single cheapest edition to any vehicle for sale in the United States of America. Because if you are looking at the rear of a Mitsubishi Mirage, you will see a square, a camera tacked on to the trunk lid, which must be the backing up camera, right? And it's clear to me that the conversation went something in the product planning team went something like, we've got to have a backup camera to be sales saying, we've got to have a backup camera to be competitive. The Mitsubishi Mirage must have a backup camera. We're losing sales because you don't have a backup camera. And the accountants went, well, we're not giving you any more money for the backup camera. And the salespeople went, we've got to have one. And there's, and the they both went to the engineers. What's the cheapest way we can get a backup camera? And the engineers went, well, you can drill a hole in the trunk and tack one in. And, you know, for an extra three cents, we can spray it body color. And nobody in the room said, but that will nice. look absolutely terrible. It will look worse than if you bought your own kit from an auto factor store and installed it on the car. Nobody said that. And they went ahead with this grotesque camera on the, the trunk lid. And I, I, I was following somebody with one the other day. And I thought if I said this to the owner, they would be confused. They bought a cheap car and their cheap car had a backup camera. And I realized that what I perceived as, ugliness in fact was design minimalism even design excellence because a Mitsubishi Mirage buyer does not covet a camera which has been expensively hidden he or she is happy merely with the functionality of being able to reverse and the basic functional transport that a Mitsubishi Mirage provides Does look like a sort of slightly misplaced arsehole. Yeah. Like when cats walk away like from that. you. Oh, cars a bit like that, really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a little bit. Took me a while to find that picture, so, but yeah, no, it does look weird. It very much does look like one pass with a bit of blue tack and gone, yeah. That, so these do. few questions, sort of quick fire questions I've got at the uh at the end here. Um What's your favourite YouTube channel at the moment? Uh, North Dakota Yak Angler. So, well, that yak as in kayak. It's a guy in North Dakota who goes fishing in his kayak and he fishes for, like, smallmouth bass and largemouth bass and he doesn't do any whooping or hollering. And he catches them and goes, oh, it's a beautiful fish. And they're really nice. Oh, it's a good fight. It really got the adrenaline going. And he lets it go really quickly. Um, he's just a really cool, chilled out ASMR guy about <laughs> if he's, he just loves his fishing, you know. And he goes along. And they're about 10 minutes long. And he's really good <laughs> at fishing. And it's a nice, relaxing way to spend sort of 10 or 15 minutes during the day. And he uploads about once a week. And you go, oh, yeah, cool. And just watch a bit of that. He might catch a big pike or something like that. Yeah, wow. And then carry on. It's nice, well, chilled out. 10 minutes I was going to say, day. I didn't realize How fishing was a spectator sport, but then I remember that vacation that we took to Scotland many, many years ago where you fished and I sat on the bank and read a mystery, a book about mysteries of Scotland or something, if I recall correctly. But I didn't fish, it was a spectator sport for me, so all right. Um, so my favorite YouTube channel at the moment is, is this Chops Garage guy, this guy down in Barnstable. In, uh, in North Devon there, buying and selling $5,000 cars, trying to do it honestly and just showing you what uh, sh how it's not 
the, the used car trade is not dishonest because people set out to be dishonest. It's because more often than not, the customers are dishonest or there's just a misunderstanding around what's involved to actually make a car you know, usable and sound and, and, and so on. So, yeah, just an interesting uh, learning for me. What's your favourite car at the moment? At the moment. Um, just, what, on just sale at the like moment? Say, like, uh, what we talked about recently, of, I'm just mean of the moment. It's a totally spontaneous thing. I've been enjoying the Mrs. Fiesta ST at the moment. I've been driving that since I got back. It's great. I mean, it looks great. It's a little pugnacious little... We've been considering keeping it when we moved to France uh, and therefore having it at home, not selling it because we own it and I love it. I don't want to get rid of it. And then when we come back to the UK, just keeping it in storage. And when we come back to the UK, we can use it. I drove my Fiesta like ST over to Copperopolis yesterday. Um, when I checked the oil at Copperopolis, the temperature on the gauge was 104 degrees and it was too hot to touch the hood. Like literally I was like, Oh, oh, oh to touch, touch in the, uh, the hood. It was so, <laughs> it was so hot. Um, such a fun little car on, on twisty roads like that. So not a freeway car. The suspension's so hard. Like I was like, have these wheels squared off? Cause I'd not driven it for a, a little bit there. Um, but no, what a marvellous little car. Love the, the Fiesta ST. But actually, my favourite car at the moment is is that E55. I've driven that um, really since I got back over the summer, just a 2002. I used it throughout Pebble, did a 1,000 miles on, you know, through Pebble Week, going backwards and forwards and doing different stuff when I was uh, around there. And I just love how that car drives. Um, in a previous podcast, I did. we talked about the Western Automotive Journalist event. And I drove an AMG GT53 there. Um, that car, that car did not impress me. In this, it was not the same car as mine. I preferred my old E55 to the modern E53. Hang on a minute. Hello, Dana. Hi, I need a back consultation quickly. Okay. I know he wants the Louisville Slugger, which is like a brand of that, but they only have that one in like 26 inch, which is the T-ball. It says T-ball on it. So I think he's going to reject it. Like, yeah. I don't think he's going to be happy with it, yeah. but they do have the Rollins, which is, you know, his brand of glove and everything else that is, it says pro model 28 inch. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? We need to order a Louisville Slugger in a longer length or go somewhere else. Okay, let me look online and see if it comes that way. Yeah, online you can go order them in in each of the in 26, 27 or 28 inch for about 30 or 40 dollars. Yeah, that's about the price here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you can order a Louisville Slugger? Yes. Yeah. Okay, why don't you do that and print it out and we'll give it from Granny and Granddad and we'll just order it. Okay. That's what he really wants. Okay. Yeah, I know that's okay. what he really wants. Yeah. He's not yeah. going to want the... He's got to have the Louisville Slugger I on think it. so. Yeah. Okay, all right. Can you do that then? Because I just raced over here and now I have to go get my hair cut. Okay. But can you do it and like print it? Yeah. I'm still right. I'm still recording the, the pod at the moment. Okay, sorry. Is there anything else your parents would want me to get him from here? I'm sure he would want, like, a baseball backpack or something, but... No, no. Don't worry about that. So they were like, we feel like the bat's not enough. And and I was like, no, I feel like it is because it's so important to Ollie. Yeah, he really wants it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm going to get out of here then. All right. Okay, love you. I love you, Dana. Bye. 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 So um, what's your favorite bike right now? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I watched an old 44 Teeth video where uh, Al was ta Fagan was taking around that Kawasaki um, uh, in in a in a in the gap in between superbike races or something. He took the Kawasaki was it K's not the KZ one the um the one that they did the uh, the 240 horsepower 
supercharged one, whatever that one H2. was. H2. Um, yeah, H2. He took that round at one of the laps and did a rev bomb going down the straight on it. Um, that thing's a beast. Um, I sort of love how it just OTT is in every way. <laughs> a superb looking cut bike. Um, it definitely looked the part in Top Gun. In this Top Gun Maverick movie, the bike so looked the part. He rides it without a helmet. Oh, he's got one of that. I haven't seen that yet. He rides it without a helmet, of course, but he totally looks the part. Of course. Part. Yeah. Um, my favourite bike at the moment is... Um, do you remember when we were at Goodwood? Um, I picked up the, the, the flyer for the Vimatora Tezzi H2. And at the time, I wasn't sure mm. about it at all. But I've kept the flyer and I've kept on looking at it, especially the Tricolore version. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But really. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember it. Yeah, really yeah. an aw- Bit front heavy, but super. Yeah. that At the time, I wasn't sure. But at the time, I was busy being overwhelmed and cynical about seeing Porsches, which, you know, I, I just know what a fabulous looking motorcycle. And because it's been sitting on my this the, the fly has been sitting on my desk it's been uh, it's been obsessing me um now um what are you reading uh i haven't been reading anything at the moment to be honest because i've been writing and if i it's the same spare time I most recently read um, an article in Haggerty um, about um, this was my morning, you know, toilet reading about how the Countach and it, it wasn't what I was thinking was this is the Lamborghini Countach becoming like accepted as a collector car. It never used to be accepted as a collector car. Now it's accepted as a collector car because it's sitting in this magazine. And, you know, the previous article was talking about Lincoln's and and had some quote from Frank Lloyd Wright, the great architect. And then, you know, you flip on a few pages and there's artsy photos of Lamborghini count with 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 the doors up. Um, and I just feel that's crazy because even five years ago, they were far too Honda Civic Type R. It's ugly with those crazy, silly wings and doors. You know, that was what um, the Lamborghini Countach was certainly 10 years ago, probably still five years ago. And now it, it's crossed over. So I just thought that that was interesting. And perhaps that, perhaps that's the story of Pebble. I said there were loads of supercars at Pebble. Perhaps that's the the, the main story um, for for Pebble. Look at that. We've we've talked for our time here now, and we never once mentioned what car won Pebble Beach or anything about what you actually saw whilst you were touring around France. Marvellous. Thank <laughs> you for your time, Mark. A pleasure. Take care. Bye. This episode has been brought to you by Grand Touring Motorsports as part of our Motoring Podcast Network. For more episodes like this, tune in each week for more exciting and educational content from organizations like the Exotic Car Marketplace, the Motoring Historian, Brake Fix, and many others. If you'd like to support Grand Touring Motorsports and the Motoring Podcast Network, sign up for one of our many sponsorship tiers at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. Please note that the content, opinions, and materials presented and expressed in this episode are those of its creator, and this episode has been published with their consent. If you have any inquiries about this program, please contact the creators of this episode via email or social media, as mentioned in the episode.